So, first, I have some requests for you. If you want to take photos of me, well, please don't put any photos of me into Facebook, Instagram, or WhatsApp. Those are three tentacles of the same surveillance monster. That company does not have users, it has users. <laughs> it uses people to get their personal data and to get other people's personal data. Facebook can recognize people in photos by their faces or the backs of their heads. So if you put into Facebook, and I don't care which tentacle it is, a photo that shows a certain person, you are helping the company track that person, which is a bad way to treat your friends, and it's a bad way to treat me. So please don't do that to me. And I hope you will decide not to be a used of Facebook at all. <clears throat> Second, if you want to take a photo of me with a mobile device, please deactivate the feature of putting the geolocation into photos. Before you take the photo, you have to deactivate that functionality. And you do it by going to the camera app and then looking at its parameters. There will be a parameter about geolocation in photos. Turn it off. It's not enough just to turn off location in general, people tell me. You have to go do it in the camera app itself. Uh, also, if you want to take, if you want to make a recording, audio or video, and distribute copies, please do so only in the formats that are favorable to free software. That means the AUG formats or the WebM format. Also, please make sure that the distribution site permits people to download copies without making them run any non-free software to do it. So, for instance, YouTube has a problem to access any video on YouTube, you have to run the non-free JavaScript code that is in every YouTube page. So YouTube is not a good place to distribute a video. And also, please put on the recordings the Creative Commons No Derivatives License because this is a presentation of a point of view. So, free software. What is free software? It's software that respects users' freedom and community. So it's an issue of freedom, not price. Uh, it's liberty, not gratuito. <laughs> We're not concerned with the question of price at all because that doesn't raise an ethical issue. If you get a copy of a program gratis, or if you pay for that copy, well, that's a minor detail. The question that we care about is, once you have a copy, how does it treat you? Does it treat you ethically and justly, or does it try to subjugate you? Does it give someone else power over you? What have you got once you have a copy of that program? That's the question we're concerned about. If that copy, respect your freedom and community, then we're happy because it's free software. And if it doesn't respect your freedom and community, it's doing wrong to you. And that's what we want to put an end to. But what is a program? What's a computer? A computer is a universal computing engine. It can be programmed to do all sorts of things, but really it's very simple. Really it only does one thing. Get the next instruction and do what that says. And then get the next instruction and do what that says. And get the next instruction and do what that says. Millions of times a second, it will get the next instruction and do what that says. That's all a computer can really do. But the instructions come from a program. 
depending on what instructions are in that program, it will make the computer do this or that or something else. In fact, the right program can make that computer do anything at all except for the impossible things, the things that computers just can't do like that. So the question is, who gives the instructions to your computer? You might think it's you, when really it's someone else. <laughs> you might think your computer obeys you, when really it obeys someone else, its real master. And it does things for you when the real master is willing to let it. The real master is always ultimately in control, not you. With any program, there are two possibilities. Either the users control the program, or the program controls the users. There's no other possibility, so it's always one of these two. When the users control the program, we call that free software. Why? Well, it is free software, in fact. And why is that? Well, freedom means having control of your own life, control of the activities you do in your life. But if you use a program to do the activity, control of the activity requires control of the program. Therefore, when the users control the program, it respects their freedom, they control their activities and their lives, so it's free software. In practice, the concrete criterion for free software is that the program gives users the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is to run the program however you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is a freedom to study the program source code and change it so it does your computing activities the way you wish. Why do we emphasize source code here? Well, there's some source code. It's a combination of English and math. If you've learned this programming language, you can read the source code, understand what the code says, and let's see what the program will do. And then you can change it so it will do something else you prefer. To run the program, we convert it into executable code, which is almost incomprehensible. For a tiny program like this, yes, you could figure out, it's not that hard for such a small program, you could figure out what these ones and zeros mean. But for a real program, suppose it's uh, <clears throat> 100,000 lines of source code, well, the executable code would be millions of ones and zeros, and figuring out what they mean without the help of the source code is tremendously hard. It's a one method of reverse engineering, and it's so hard that people only do it when they're desperate as a last resort. So, if the developer said to users, you are free to change this program, if you can figure out what these ones and zeros mean, that's mocking the user's freedom. That's not real respect for their freedom. It's a theoretical freedom that nobody can exercise. So, in order for freedom one to be real, the users must get the real source code. These two freedoms give users separate control over the program. Separate control means I'm free to change my copies, and you're free to change your copies, and you're free to change your copies. Separate control, so here we see one user who is changing her copy, and three other users that are using the program just the way they got it. They're not changing anything. Well, separate control is absolutely necessary, but it's not enough because most users are not programmers and they don't know how to read source code, they won't understand it and they don't know how to change it. 
There are a lot of other useful, important, even interesting things to do in life. There's no reason to expect everyone to be a programmer or to have that capability, to have that talent. But these users who don't know how to program, they deserve control over their computer too. How can we give it to them? Through collective control. Collective control is the freedom to work together with others to decide what the program should do and change it to do what you want. At the top, we see three users working together to make a modified version of this program. The two on the right are changing the code directly. They must be programmers. The one on the left is not touching the code. Maybe person is not a programmer. But person does get to participate in control of the program by participating in their discussions about what changes to make. This is what enables non-programmers to have some say over what their software does. Those who cooperate in this way are those who choose to cooperate. Others may choose not to. At the bottom, there are two other users who are using the original version of that program, and they're not working with those three. Why not? It could be any reason. Maybe they don't know about each other. Maybe they don't like each other or don't trust each other. Or maybe they just disagree about what they want the program to do. Maybe those two prefer the original version. They just don't like the changes that those three are making. Maybe tomorrow they'll start working together, all five. It, it's up to them. Collective control requires two more essential freedoms. Freedom two is to make exact copies and give or sell them to others when you wish. Freedom three is to make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others when you wish. These two freedoms give the users collective control because whenever some users would like to work together to form a group, either formal or informal, they're free to do so. Because if, when one of them makes a modified version, with freedom three, person can make copies and distribute them to others in the group. And they, with freedom two, can make more copies of that same version and distribute them to others in the group. They're also free to offer copies of this version to those who are not in the group. For instance, to publish it, which simply means offering copies to the general public. <clears throat> so, if the program carries the four freedoms thoroughly and completely, then it's free software. <laughs> so that you remember, I should repeat what they are, because that's the most important point in the whole talk. Freedom zero is to run the program as you wish for whatever purpose. Freedom one is to study the source code of the program and change it so it does your computing activities the way you wish. Freedom two is to make exact copies and give or sell them to others when you wish. And freedom three is to make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others when you wish. And I should point out that you're free to do these things, but you're not required to do these things. With Freedom Zero, you're free to run the program as you wish, but it's not required. If you're a masochist, you could run it the way you don't wish. <laughs> you also have the choice of not running the program. <laughs> With Freedom One, you're free to study the source code and change it, but it's not required. You can get the program and run it immediately without looking at anything. With Freedom 2, you're free to make and distribute copies when you wish, but you're never required to do so. On any occasion, it's your choice whether to distribute a copy to someone and whether you want to charge money for doing so. 
And with Freedom 3, if you make a modified version, you're free to distribute copies of that. But it's not required. You can use your modified version privately. Whether to distribute it ever to others is up to you. So, if the program comes with these four freedoms thoroughly, it's free software because thanks to these four freedoms, the users control the program. And that makes it free software. But if one of these freedoms is missing or incomplete, then the users don't really control this program. Instead, the program controls the users and the proprietor controls the program. So this program, this non-free program, gives the proprietor power over the users. Unjust power that is intolerable, power that nobody should ever have over anybody else because it takes their freedom away. So this is the basic injustice of non-free software. This is why every non-free program is an injustice because it's non-free. I don't know if the camera calls for adjustment now. Uh, that's for someone running the camera to decide. Okay, good. So, this basic injustice leads to other injustices. Because nowadays, the proprietor or developer is aware of having power over the users. And power corrupts. The developer faces the temptation to exercise that power for its own advantage. To exercise it in ways that will gain more money at the expense of its users. In other words, the developers, excuse me, the developers of proprietary software put malicious functionalities into the program hurting the users, but benefiting themselves. This means that they make the program malware. Malware means a program designed to run in a way that mistreats the user. This is a question of what's in the code, what it does when it runs. To distinguish this, free versus proprietary software, that's a question of how the program is made available to users. It's entirely independent of what is in the code. Any program could be released as free software and could be released as proprietary software. Sometimes the same code is available in both ways in parallel. So philosophically, proprietary software and malware are completely independent questions. But in practice, they go together. Proprietary software is usually malware, and free software is hardly ever malware. And the reason is, the proprietary developers, because they know they have power, they are tempted to make it malware. And free software developers, because we know we don't have power over you, we don't face the temptation. We're protected from temptation because we don't have power. So what do the proprietary programs do that is malicious? Often they spy on users. This example is the Amazon Swindle, Amazon's ebook reader which is designed to swindle readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books, including total surveillance of what the user does. Every so often, the swindle transmits the title of the book to Amazon servers. So even 
if you didn't get the book from Amazon, Amazon still knows what book you read. And it knows the page number you're on. And if the user enters any notes, they're sent to Amazon. If the user highlights any text, sent to Amazon. Complete Orwellian surveillance of reading. But snooping is found in lots of programs and products. Flash Player helps websites track users. Windows spies on users. Mac OS spies on users. Android spies on users. The software of the iThings spies on users. The software in many products spies on users. Smart TVs, for instance, tell some company what the user watches. If a product is called smart, that probably means it's malicious. <laughs> Lots of apps spy on users. Even flashlight apps. All the flashlight app has to do is light up the screen. Why should it communicate with anyone else? There's no possible reason except spying. But it's observed that the flashlight apps do communicate with various websites. Somebody did a study of the several thousand most popular Android apps and found that of the, of the paid apps, 60% of them had recognizable tracker software in them. And of the gratis apps, 90% had recognizable tracker software. Of course, none of these apps are free software. They're proprietary and gratis, or they're proprietary and paid. But that's a minor detail. <clears throat> Streaming apps spy on users because they're tethered to a particular server. For instance, uh, Spotify works only with the Spotify server. And the Spotify server makes users identify themselves and it keeps track of what the user watches. Sorry, this is uh, in the case of Spotify. Well, that's spying on people, and I say, out, out, damn Spotify. <laughs> and Netflix does the same. Transportation apps spy on people. The Uber app is tied to, to the Uber server, and it makes users identify themselves, so it enables the Uber server to determine where each person goes. And that is surveillance that threatens democracy. Of course, the app also spies on people's movements before and after the ride. <clears throat> so this is why I refuse to be a customer of Uber. In fact, I refuse to ride in an Uber car even if somebody else sets up the ride and pays for it. Because Uber is such a dangerous threat to our freedom that we should all aim to destroy it. For our freedom's sake, destroy Uber. <laughs> Uber is trying to eliminate ordinary taxis. If it succeeds, there will be no way to go anywhere without identifying yourself and being tracked. Uber may destroy buses as well. There's no limit to how much it may impoverish our lives. Tying products to servers is common also. This is the Fitbit. The Fitbit sends personal data to a server, and then the server offers to sell that data back to the user. What gall? 
but there are many products that do this. In fact, most of the products that are called the Internet of Things seem to be full of malware of this kind. I call it the Internet of Stings. It's happened several times that people bought one of these products which required use of a particular server and then eventually when the product was no longer considered interesting, the company shut down the server and the product became useless. You can't trust such a thing. But there's another malicious functionality, DRM, Digital Restrictions Management, uh, uh, as algemas digitais, <laughs> where the product is designed to restrict you by stopping you from doing what you want to do. This is the blue ray that attacks users when they try to copy. Uh, it's a malicious functionality. And my principle is never to use a product with DRM, never to use a product that was designed to restrict the user, unless I personally have available what is needed to break the handcuffs. If you have something to enable you to break the Blu-ray disc handcuffs and copy it anyway, then go ahead and use Blu-ray discs. But otherwise, you should reject them completely for your freedom's sake, as I do. Now, DRM is found in most apps that deal with any kind of media including in some cases YouTube. And the base for DRM is implemented in all the main proprietary operating systems, including Windows, Mac OS, Android, and the system of the iMonsters. <laughs> <laughs> then there are back doors. It's hard to tell that a program has a back door unless you see it operating. A backdoor receives commands from somebody, commands that tell the program to do something nasty to the user, whether the user likes it or not. Uh, the backdoor doesn't ask the user for permission to do this thing, it just does it. So, one example we know of is in the Amazon Swindle. It has a backdoor for remote with which Amazon can remotely erase books. We know this because in 2009, people saw that Amazon remotely erased thousands of copies of a particular book in a giant Orwellian act. And what was the book? It was 1984 by George Orwell. I'm not making this up. If I were writing fiction, I wouldn't dare write this because people would say it wasn't believable. <laughs> this is not fiction, this is fact. Somebody came to my talk once and said he had seen the book disappear as he was in the middle of reading it. There was a lot of criticism so Amazon said it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state. If you've read 1984, this is not a very comforting promise. <laughs> 1984 was about a state that destroyed books as well as people and other nasty things. But It wasn't a promise anyway. It was just some noise Amazon could make to take the momentum out of the criticism. It wasn't <coughs> a, a serious promise and it had no legal force. So a few years later, Amazon resumed remotely erasing books without even an order from the state.
Well, we know of a few other backdoors with limited capabilities. The system of the iMonsters has a backdoor to remotely erase apps. Apple can order an app to be deleted. And Android is worse. You know, Android includes some free components and some proprietary components. Google Play is proprietary, and that's where the back door is. Google can order it to do, delete an app or order it to install a specific app. If you use Android, Google can make an app specially for you and force it to be installed. Then there is censorship. Apple was the first company to make a general purpose computer which did not allow users to freely install the programs of their choice. They could only install programs approved by Apple from Apple's store. When the users of the iPhone discovered ways to get around the censorship so they could install apps without permission from Apple, they called it jailbreaking. In effect, jailbreaking means escaping from jail. So in effect, they recognize that these computers are jails for their users. And that's our term for such a computer. Apple did it first, but Microsoft followed the same path a few years later. There are also universal backdoors. This is a kind of backdoor which is all powerful because it includes the ability to change the software. By changing the software, the developer can do absolutely anything to that poor helpless user. There is a universal backdoor in Windows. It was first discovered in Windows XP. People demonstrated that it existed, but Microsoft refused to admit it. In Windows 7, Microsoft announced the presence of that backdoor. Although they didn't call it a universal backdoor, they called it auto-upgrade which is another word for the same thing. Microsoft can forcibly change the software in the device at any time, whether the user likes it or not. Meaning that the users of that system are completely helpless at the mercy of Microsoft. There's also a universal backdoor in the Amazon swindle, in the Wii U, and in nearly all portable phones. The backdoor in portable phones has been used frequently to convert them into listening devices that listen all the time and transmit everything they hear. And you don't have to speak right into the microphone, because remember, they can do speakerphone functionality. They can hear conversations all around the room and transmit them. And if you think you could get your privacy back by switching it off, guess what? The phone has no off switch. <laughs> All it has is a button you can use to ask the phone to please turn itself off. But once the phone has been modified in this way, it doesn't really turn off. It only pretends to turn off. While well, really it keeps running, listening, and transmitting. The only way to make it stop is to remove all the batteries. All the batteries, and sometimes the phone has batteries that can't be removed. So, when you put this together with the fact that the phone's location is being tracked all the time by triangulation from various different towers, they can tell very precisely where the phone is at any moment. And they record it every few minutes. And they keep the recording for a long time. So, a device that says where the person is and can listen to the conversations around that person, I call it Stalin's dream. 
What would Stalin have loved most? He would have loved to give everyone in the Soviet Union a device that would report that person's movements and listen to that person's conversations. <laughs> Except that poor Stalin, he couldn't do it because the technology wasn't developed yet. But now it exists. And most of you have been convinced to carry these around and they didn't even have to threaten to shoot you. <laughs> what wimps these people be? I had good luck though. I had a special good fortune because I'm a slow adopter of new technology. I expect it to be malicious. So I hesitate. And by the time I thought about whether I might want to get a mobile phone, I checked around and I found out these things. And I realized that this was a terrible attack on our freedom. And I said, absolutely not. That's why I have never had a mobile phone. I refuse to carry one because I feel it's my duty as a citizen to defend our privacy against these massive surveillance systems. I do use mobile phones, other people's mobile phones. <laughs> With luck, I only use each one once. If I'm in a bus and I need to tell a friend what time I'm going to arrive, I say, could someone make a call for me or send a text for me? This way, Big Brother doesn't know it's me. <laughs> now, the back door is there, and we can't fix it, because there's a part of the portable phone that runs only proprietary software. We have no way to correct this bug. In fact, you could say that Mobile phones don't just have bugs, they are bugs. There's another nasty thing that Microsoft does. And when Microsoft learns of a security flaw in Windows, it shows the error to the NSA before fixing it, thus directly betraying all of its users. Do you think the Brazilian government should use Windows? No. Obviously not. It's basically making the state totally vulnerable to the U.S. And what the U.S. will do to Latin American countries is not very pretty. I read that uh, Jilma had direct experience with it. <laughs> so, I've only given you a few examples. We have more than 300 examples of proprietary malware in gnu.org slash proprietary. But these are enough to show that almost all people who use proprietary software are victims of known proprietary malware. Because they're using at least one of the things I mentioned just now. So we know that they're being mistreated. Why do those companies do it? They found ways to make money by mistreating their own users. And since they have no ethics, they do it. Now, we know of these 300 cases where specific soft, proprietary software is malware. And there are thousands more proprietary programs which we don't know about. Well, there are probably hundreds of thousands of proprietary programs, and most of them we don't know whether they're malware or not. And we can't check because they won't let us see the source code. So we could only speculate. The result is 
sometimes a proprietary program is known malware, established, demonstrated malware. And the rest of the time, it's possible malware. You can never, I'm sure there are proprietary programs that are not malware, but we can't identify even one of them. Every proprietary program is either established malware or possible malware. The, which means that you can't ever have a rational basis to trust a proprietary program. It's blind faith or nothing. And often it's blind faith in a company that has already betrayed the users, but asks for you to be really, really dumb and trust it yet another time. <coughs> so using non-free software is asking to be taken. And I hope you'll get smart enough to say no, no way, never. The only way to have a rational basis to trust a program is if it is free software, because then the users control the program and we contributors do not. And we know that. And that protects us from temptation because we don't have power. With free software, the users have a defense against malware. It's the only known defense against malware, which is they can check the source code and they can fix it. And people do check the source code from time to time, typically because they want to add a feature or fix a bug. But in the process, if there's anything malicious in the part that they're studying, they can see that and they can start a scandal and someone will fix it. That can <coughs> happen with proprietary software. Even for these hundreds of programs we know are malware, we can't fix them. The users are not allowed to fix them. That's what proprietary software means. So, in order to have freedom and escape from malicious software, you need to escape from proprietary software and come live with us in the free world that we have built. We built it with the GNU operating system and the kernel Linux. Together, they create the free world that gives us the, op the opportunity to be free. I developed the GNU operating system specifically for this reason. I wanted to make it possible to use a computer and have freedom. <clears throat> that, that was in 1983. I wanted to use computers in freedom, but it was impossible. Every computer needs an operating system in order to be useful. And in 83, all the computers required, all the operating systems for the new computers of the day were proprietary. If you bought a computer, you had to run it with a proprietary system and lose your freedom. So in 1984, I started developing the GNU system. The goal was to make a free software operating system so that people could use their computers with only free software. In 1991, GNU was nearly complete, but one major essential component was missing. That was the kernel. The kernel is the component of an operating system that allocates the machine's resources to the other programs that you run. We started developing a kernel in 1990, but I chose a design that appears to have been too advanced, too elegant. We hired someone to write the system, but it took six years to have a test version. Too bad. But fortunately, we didn't have to wait for it, because in 1991, Mr. Torvalds developed a kernel called Linux, and he actually got it to run. Now, it was not free software in 91, but in 92, he changed the license. He released it under one of the free licenses, specifically the GNU General Public License that I wrote. 
And that made Linux free software, but and so that meant people could fit Linux into the last gap in the GNU system, producing a complete free operating system, basically GNU, but also Linux. It's the GNU plus Linux or GNU slash Linux operating system. And please call it that so as to give us a share of the credit. I'm sure you've come across people who are talking about this combination and calling it Linux and not mentioning GNU at all. What they're doing is giving us no credit for our work. That's not nice. It's not fair. So please treat us right. Treat us decently. Please give us equal mention. If you say GNU slash Linux, you'll give us equal mention and you'll give Torvalds equal mention too. Since we started the whole project and we developed the biggest share of the system, I think it's fair to ask for equal mention and I hope you'll make sure to do that. In principle, GNU slash Linux is a free operating system, but in practice often it's not. Sad thing, but there are thousands of different versions of GNU slash Linux. They're called distros or distributions. And each one has its own developer group, and they decide which programs to add to it. And most of them add some non-free programs, and they make a system that's non-free. So there are a few distros that are entirely free software because their developers are committed to freedom. And then there are thousands more distros whose developers put in non-free programs and the result is a non-free distro. It'll take you closer to freedom, but it won't get you all the way there. Look in gnu.org slash distros for more information about which distros are free and which are not. If you install a non-free distro, well, you'll probably get some non-free software in there. It's still a lot better than using Windows or Mac OS. That is, it's a lot less bad than using Windows or Mac OS, but it's still partly bad. And to avoid that, install a free distro. So how does a program get to be free? Under today's copyright law, every program, because it's a written work, is automatically copyrighted. It's a very bad law for the public. <coughs> but that's the law we're stuck with. Every program is copyrighted and copyright law by default prohibits copying the program, changing the program, redistributing the program, and in some countries it even prohibits running the program. So how do we make that program free? It's done through an explicit declaration by the copyright holders, which gives every user the four freedoms. We call this a free software license. And this license changes the legal situation. It creates the four freedoms for that program. So it's absolutely essential. A program which doesn't, which is not covered by a free software license is proprietary. What that means in practice is if the program's code doesn't state a license, that program's proprietary. It's, we've got to remember that programs like that are unacceptable. They are not contributions to our community. They're handled badly and people shouldn't do that.
nowadays a lot of people put no license on their code because GitHub encourages that bad practice. GitHub has a lot of bad influence and I recommend that people not use it. The Free Software Foundation has criteria for ethical repositories. It's in gnu.org slash software slash repo criteria dot html. <clears throat> now, since we're dealing with users' freedom here, we want to leave no doubt about what freedoms the users have with any piece of code. So the license needs not only to be stated somehow, it needs to be stated clearly, very clearly, leaving no doubt about what license covers any piece of code. If you have a directory with a bunch of source files, and then there's one file that says a license, nothing has actually said that these files are available under that license. That creates a room for doubt. So what you need to do to avoid doubt is put a license notice at the top of each source file saying this file is under such and such license. Then it's really, it, there's no room for doubt anymore. Also, the license notice in each file makes it hard to mess things up by moving files around. If you see a, a, a program with a license in one file and then source files that say nothing and you copy those to another program, what happens? It may look like they're under some other license, but that's not true because it wasn't and it wasn't proclaimed by the copyright holders of that code, so it's not valid. So make sure that you, as copyright holder of code you're writing, put a license notice in each, at the top of each file. And in addition, when you're using the GNU General Public License, the license notice is what says which GPL versions apply. So that's a question that has to be answered to avoid ambiguity of the licensing. Put in the license notice, and when you see a program that hasn't done this, please politely ask the developers to clarify their licenses. There are many different free, free software licenses. Any proclamation by the copyright holders that gives users the four freedoms is a free software license and there are various ways to write it and they do different things. What they have in common is they all provide the, free, the four freedoms, but there are different ways to do that. There are two principal categories. There are the weak licenses, we also call them lax, permissive licenses or pushover licenses. And there are the copyleft licenses, the ones that defend freedom for all users. The weak licenses say, do anything you like with this code. Just keep my name on it, sometimes they say. Well, that certainly provides the four freedoms. They're, those are free licenses. But they fail to protect users' freedom. They permit too much. They actually permit proprietary unscrupulous companies to take that whole code and put it into a proprietary program, which is effectively a modified version of the original free program, but it's not free, it's proprietary. And then they can use that to subjugate users. That's what happened with Apache. Apache is a free program released under a lax permissive license. So good, lots of people use Apache and they have freedom, but 
IBM saw that and put all the code of Apache into a proprietary program, a modified version of Apache, and lots of the users are actually running that version, and they don't get any freedom. Fortunately, I had seen this before I had any new programs to release, so I knew that this was the danger. My goal was not just to have a lot of people use my code. My goal was to give them freedom, each and every one of them. And to achieve that goal, I had to prevent something from happening, like what happened with Apache later on. Apache didn't exist then. I had seen examples with other software about how this could happen. So I developed the GNU General Public License, which gives everyone the four freedoms, but requires everyone to get the four freedoms. Copyleft says, yes, you are free to redistribute exact copies or modify versions, but there's a condition on how you redistribute them. You must pass along the four freedoms fully to the users who get the code from you. And if you've made extensions in this program, well, the freedoms have to cover your extensions as well. More specifically, it says you must redistribute under the same license and with the source code. And that ensures that the people who get it from you get the four freedoms also. The same, they have to get the same freedoms from you that you got from us. And this way, copyleft says the freedom must go with every copy of every version of this program. All the users must be free. That's the purpose of copyleft. The GNU General Public License is the implementation. And the result is that companies like IBM, they contribute to the main version since they see that they are not permitted to distribute a proprietary modified version, they do the next best thing, which is work with the developers, contribute their code to the main free version, and it gets to everybody. And their contributions are quite useful. But remember, we get their contributions because the program is copyleft. If we were weak, if we allowed them to make a proprietary version, that's what they would do. And that would be no contribution at all to our community. If you're working on something and you'd like our suggestions about how to choose a license for it, look at gnu.org slash licenses slash license recommendations.html. And in general, gnu.org slash licenses gives all the information we have answering questions about licenses. Now, once all the software installed on your computer is free, there's still a danger you'll run some non-free software because lots of web pages nowadays contain programs <coughs> that get installed straight into the browser and run. Now these programs can be free or non-free, just like every other program. <clears throat> so if that program is non-free, you end up running non-free software, and you probably didn't know it because the browser doesn't say anything about it. So we developed an add-on for Firefox called LibreJS which checks all these programs to see whether they're free and also whether they're trivial. And if the program is either trivial or free, LibreJS permits it to run. But otherwise, LibreJS blocks it, and you can see on the screen that there are non-free programs in there. And it does one other thing. It searches heuristically through the site 
looking for where and how to contact the webmasters. That's to make it quick and easy to complain. You just have to click, it will show you how to contact the webmasters, then you click on the address and it gives you a box and you can type in your complaint. I couldn't use your site because it tried to make me run non-free software in JavaScript in the web page. Please fix that. Send. In less than one minute, you can send your complaint. In 10 minutes a day, you can complain to 10 different sites. Please do that. We need your help. We need to put pressure on those webmasters to take it seriously. Now, the traditional way to lose control of your computing is to install a non-free program in your computer. And you let that do your computing. And it's just as bad as it ever was. But now there's another way you can lose control of your computing activity, which is called SAS, Service as a Software Substitute which means someone sets up a service which invites you to entrust your computing activities to that service so that the service does your computing instead of a program in your own computer. Well, if a program in your own computer is doing your computing, then you have a chance of controlling it. If it's free software, then you control it. But when it's done in somebody else's server, you can't possibly have any control over that. It's the server operator that has control. The server operator can put in different software at any time. And if there's a free program running in that server, that copy belongs to the server operator. And it's the server operator who can modify it, not you. You can't modify programs in that in that server. So the result is you have no control over how your computing is done. So it's the so SAS, service as a software substitute, is the equivalent of running a non-free program yourself. But it's actually even worse. I mentioned that many non-free programs spy on the user and send data to to servers, well, to use SAS, you'd have to send all the pertinent data to the server. And the result is the same. The server ends up with all your data, knowing a lot about you that it shouldn't know. So SAS is inherently equivalent to running a non-free program that spies on the user. But it's actually worse than that. I explained that some non-free programs have a universal backdoor. The developer can remotely change the code and thus change how your computing is done or how the user's computing is done. I hope the user's not you. Uh, without asking per for permission to change it. Well, with SAS, the server operator at any time can install different programs and change how the user's computing is done without asking. So SAS is inherently equivalent to running a non-free program that spies on the user and has a universal backdoor. It's absolute poison and you should never use it. So we want to be free, but there are obstacles we have to cross. One of them is social inertia. The companies that subjugate people with proprietary software get lots of money, and they use that money to create <coughs> obstacles to escaping, which are forms of social inertia. Social inertia means that 
it's hard to make society change from what it's doing now to something else. It resists change. And sometimes this happens naturally, but the developers are skilled in creating inertia, creating artificial obstacles to make it harder to, for people to change. Now, one of these is the network effect. A communication system becomes more convenient and attractive when more people are using it. The result is that people face pressure to use the communication systems that lots of other people use, such as Skype. Lots of people understand that the Skype client is proprietary software, and Skype is designed to spy on users' conversations. So it's a bad thing. And they know that they should stop for their own freedom's sake, but they feel pressured by their friends, relatives, or colleagues that use Skype and want them to use Skype, so they surrender. What they don't think about is, when they surrender, they become part of the pressure on everybody else. Other people will be saying they have to use Skype because that person is using Skype. So, first of all, they're, in the first place, they are victims of the proprietary program. But because of the network effect, they are also co-perpetrators. They're part of the problem, as well as victims of the problem. So what this means is, it's your duty not to use Skype. It's not just for your own sake that you should confuse, it's for the sake of all the people you, who might want to talk with you, so that you don't pressure them to use Skype. Another example is the contracts Microsoft imposed on PC manufacturers that require the manufacturers to pay for a, light, a Windows license for every computer that's sold, even if people don't want to use Windows on it. Now those contracts should be illegal, but they're not. And then there is the, uh, the effect that when schools teach certain software, they graduate people who know that software, and then businesses find themselves pressured to use that software too, because that's what graduates know. And this happens with Windows, but also to some extent with Mac OS or the iThings, and it's just as bad no matter what program it is. If it's proprietary software, anything that pressures others to use it is bad. So when you go to the businesses and say, you shouldn't use Windows, that is harmful to society, that the executives say, we have to use Windows, that's what schools teach people to do. And when you go to the schools, they say, we have to teach Windows because that's what employers want. So each one is saying, we can't change first, we have to wait for the other. Each one is waiting for the other, well that's no good. The school, because it has a social mission, must change first. So when these companies show up, when they appear on your campus to sell something or recruit employees, you should hold a protest. They should meet people with signs saying, get out of here. Another obstacle is open source. You've probably noticed that I have not used that term. I have not even used the word open, not even once. That's because open source stands for a different idea based on different values. I don't agree with that, that idea, so I don't promote it. I never use that term. In fact, the term open source was coined in 1998 by people that disagreed with the philosophical values of the free software movement. Our values are freedom and community. We say that this is an issue of justice or injustice. A non-free program is an injustice. 
That's exactly what they didn't want to say ever. So they coined another term that had not been used in our field, and then they constructed a different discourse based on practical convenience values only, one which never raised the issue in terms of right or wrong, justice or injustice, freedom or subject, subjection. And that way they could hush up our ideas completely, cause them to be forgotten, or so they hoped. And they came pretty close. We've had to work very hard to stop that, and we still have to work hard. So to, to see how these two different philosophies are different, we say if you develop and distribute a program, it's your moral duty to let the users change and redistribute it. Open source people will never say that, because that might make business executives feel uncomfortable, and they don't want to do that bad effect. So they'll say, if you develop and distribute a program, please think whether it's in your practical interest to let users change and redistribute it, because then they could improve the quality of the source code. So look at the difference in values. For us, the values are freedom and community. For them, quality of code. That's not a deep foundation. It can't, it can't support principled refusal to do something. But principled refusal is what we need. That's what makes us strong. So if we want people to refuse things on principle, we've got to show them why it's important. An open source intentionally shows people only the shallow secondary reasons. Unfortunately, in 1998, most of the community held their values and their philosophy um, Almost all the businesses, and, and they started saying open source. Almost all the businesses started saying open source. The politicians and journalists followed the businesses, followed the money, and since then, in the important media, you almost only see open source. They don't talk about free software. Maybe it's somewhat better here. Have you seen major media talk about software DV? Ah, so they have pushed it out here also. Um, so we have to push back. We now have to work to show the users of our software that there is such a thing as the free software movement and the free software idea and what it is. And we're working against those major media, so we have to keep at it. I've even seen articles that called me the father of open source. It's <laughs> 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 like saying that Lula founded the PMDB. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not true. So, what do I do? I sent a letter to the editor saying, if I'm the father of open source, it was created through artificial insemination <laughs> using stolen sperm without my knowledge or consent. <laughs> And then I explain what the free software movement stands for, which is the serious point of the letter, but it's nice to start with a joke because then they might print it. <laughs> but I can't do enough. You have to help. And the way you help is never talk about open source. 
if somebody else starts talking to you about open source, you should say software libre. <coughs> Show that you care about freedom, even if the other people don't. And it's especially useful when there's a discussion on a mailing list about what to do, and they start discussing whether to use open source or not, you can start saying, well, we have to choose software delivery for these ethical reasons. You just don't use the term open source in your response. And even if you don't win that particular, on that particular decision, you will have educated everybody in the list, including the majority that are not actually saying anything. They'll see what you say. So you have an opportunity to teach them that there is such a thing as free software and what the idea is and that it's different from open source. I am eager to take these opportunities every time I come to them. And you can do it too. Another obstacle is when the specs of hardware are secret. How are we going to develop a free program to use the hardware if they won't tell us how to run the hardware? The only way is through reverse engineering, which means studying how the non-free software talks to the hardware to figure out what the commands of the hardware are, and then pass that to somebody else who will write a free replacement program. Reverse engineering is hard, but people can do it. And in these cases, it's necessary. If you want to make a very important technical contribution to the free community, do reverse engineering. In fact, this university ought to teach reverse engineering. It should have a class. It's a very important field. It's a good profession to be in because there are not that many people who do it and there's lots of demand. So this university should be preparing its students to go into that line of work, but also preparing them to help the free software community overcome this very painful problem. Speaking of schools, Schools should teach exclusively free software, no exceptions. And when I say schools, I mean everything from nursery school to university and adult education. And when I say teach, I don't just mean formal training. I mean leading and showing students how to use that program. That's teaching it. The school should teach only, exclusively, free software. It should do this because it has a social mission to educate good citizens of a society that is strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free. And this should not be a mysterious, inexplicable policy. On the contrary, the school should teach why it has this policy. It should teach about the four freedoms. It should teach about the social mission of the school and why that requires teaching only free software. And it should explain that teaching a non-free program means implanting dependence in society. And that goes against the social mission of the school. Teaching people to use non-free software is like teaching them to smoke tobacco. The school should not make students dependent on things that will be bad for them. But there's another reason. For moral education and citizenship, schools must teach the habit of helping other people teach people to be good, cooperating members of their community. So every class should have this rule. Students, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share it with the rest of the class, including source code in case someone here wants to learn, because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. Therefore, you may not bring proprietary software to this class except for reverse engineering. 
The school must set a good example, which means following its own rule. It must bring only free software to class and share copies, including source code, with everyone in the class, except for reverse engineering exercises, because there the source code is actually the answer to the exercise. So the school should, should hand out the source code, but after the students turn in their work. But there's another reason for the sake of education of programmers. Every program embodies knowledge. If it's proprietary, it withholds that knowledge from the student. So it's the enemy of the spirit of education and should never be tolerated in a class, in a school, except to do reverse engineering which is the way you extract the knowledge that the program is supposed to withhold. But a free program offers its knowledge to the student, so it supports the spirit of education. That's the software that schools should choose. And how do you learn to write with clear code? You do it by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. Well, only free software offers the chance to read the code of large programs we really use. Then you have to write lots of code. If you want to get good at writing code for large programs, you have to write lots of code for large programs. But to do that, you have to start small. What does it mean to start small writing code for large programs? It means writing small changes in existing large programs. And after you've done that enough times, you can advance to writing bigger changes in large programs. And eventually you get to write large changes in large programs. Only free software offers the opportunity to write changes in existing large programs that we really use. Any school can offer the opportunity to master the craft of programming if it is a free software school. And those of you that have a relationship with a school, if you're a student or a teacher or an administrator or an employee or the parent of the student, it's your responsibility to campaign and pressure for that school to move to free software. And that includes making other people in your community, other people related to the same school, aware of the issue so as to make your movement stronger and eventually pressure the school into doing what all schools morally ought to do. Sometimes the school's administrators will say, we'll start a pilot project to see how it works. You've got to look at how big a step the school proposes to take. Clearly, migrating a university can't be done in a week. It's going to take years. But the school must start taking steps that are big enough that it could finish the job in some years and not in some centuries. <laughs> if the steps are really tiny, you can see that they'll never get there in this century. And that's not good enough. Human rights depend on each other. When you lose one human right, it becomes hard to defend the others. Now that we use computing for so many important activities in our lives, control of our computing, in other words, free software, has become one of the human rights we need in order to defend the other human rights. We must not allow it to be given up. We must win it back. And sometimes that requires a practical sacrifice. Although I would rather say, see it as refusing to sacrifice my freedom for some practical convenience. So, if we're going to be free, we have to be ready to say no to something that's attractive and perhaps convenient, but takes away our freedom. 
We have to teach ourselves the habit of saying no, 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 no. Because businesses are very clever at tempting us with a long series of different things we would be fools to accept. So it's going to, if people say, what's with you? You keep saying no, take that as praise. You have the courage to say no to all the bad things and invite them to learn from your example. So how do you help our cause? Well, if you, if you have a talent for programming, write free software. I suggest you participate in 15 projects developed by others before you try starting your own project, running your own project, because that way you'll learn how to do a good job. And when you run your own project, you'll do it well. But most people don't have a programming talent. There are other things you could do that are just as important. For instance, you can organize the campaign for free software. You could become a speaker like me. That's a way to do a lot of good. Or you could be an organizer who doesn't make a splash in public, but keeps track of the membership list and tells people when they should pay dues again and then invites speakers, arranges meetings, informs people, and keeps the organization running. You can persuade schools and governments to switch to free software. Regarding education, see gnu.org slash education. Regarding government, seek gnu.org slash government. You can, if you're a good, if you're an expert user of gnu slash Linux, you can help other users when they have problems. Start a gnu slash Linux user group or join an existing gnu slash Linux user group. If there's a gnu slash Linux user group but it erroneously calls itself a Linux user group, meaning it's not giving us any credit for our work. You could go there and help people, but also explain why they really should change the name in order to be fair to the people who develop the system. And you can save free software. That's absolutely vital, because that's how you show people that there is a free software movement. And it's not the same thing as the open source, amoral uh, development methodology they've heard about. <clears throat> For more about philosophical and political questions about free software, look at gnu.org slash philosophy. For the history of GNU, look at GNU.org slash GNU. There's also GNU.org slash distros, which says which distros are free, and GNU.org slash licenses that talks all about free software licenses, and um, GNU.org slash proprietary that lists 300 and more examples of proprietary malware with references in the press. We also have FSF.org, which is the website of the Free Software Foundation. Remember that name and you'll remember FSF. And there you can find lots of useful resources for using free software. You can find political <coughs> pressure campaigns you can support, and you can find our store. You can donate money, you can also Join as an associate member. We need your support that way. But there is a sort of store outside there where we are selling some kinds of FSF merchandise. Buying that is a way to support us. There's also a blue plastic bowl which you could put donations into. And if you want to join the FSF, you can pay me your dues in cash and fill out a card with the 
pertinent member information and give that all to me and I'll get you made a member. <clears throat> now it's time to present my other identity. <laughs>
because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> there is a traditional rivalry between Emacs and the other editor VI. <laughs> so people ask me whether in the Church of Emacs the use of VI is a sin. It's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast. <laughs> of the eye is not a sin, it's a penance. <laughs> a few years ago I went to China and some VI users proposed to meet and attack me. I was shocked, but apparently violence begins with the eye. <laughs> People have occasionally asked whether my halo is really an old computer disk. This is no computer disk, this is my halo. <laughs> but it was a computer disk in a previous existence. <laughs> Thank you. Software Foundation. If you buy the GNU, I can sign this card for you. If you have a penguin at home, you need a GNU for your penguin. <laughs> there must never be a penguin without a GNU. <laughs> so we can accept payments in cash or with a bank card because someone can process the payments for us. Paolo will do that. Or with Bitcoin if you have something here to make the payment with so I can see it. Um, and uh, when you bid, please wave your arm and shout the amount! <laughs> loud! Because I have hearing problems and you need to make sure I hear your bid. Oh, and Paolo, if, it's, if the bid is not very loud, I'd like you to repeat the bid. Because often other people do that, but they don't speak loud enough, and they're speaking at the same time, so I can't hear them anyway. It doesn't help. But with just one person reliably doing it, I'm sure I'll know what people are bidding. Don't wait for me to look at you before you shout the bid. Uh, shout it so I'll look at you. And I suggest you go a little bit further in, into uh, the audience so that you're closer to the people in the back. And I'm going to start with the usual price, which is $25 or 90 pads. So do I get 90 for this adorable canoe? Ninety guys. Who's speaking? How much? Okay, I got ninety. Do I get a hundred? How much? Okay, I got a hundred. Please don't wait before you shout. I've got a hundred. Do I get one ten? How much? Okay. One hundred. Okay, I've got 110. Do I get 120? I've got 150. I've got 150. Do I get 160? What? 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 200? I've got 200. Are you bidding? What are you bidding? 250. I've got 250. Do I get 275? I've got 250. Do I get 275 for this 
this adorable canoe. Two seventy five. Two seventy five. Two seventy five. I got two seventy what? Two eight two eight. No, no, that's too small. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got 275. Do I get 300? 300. I've got 275. Do I get 300? 300. Are you bidding? I got 300. Do I get 330? Do I get 330? Do I get 330? <laughs> I got 330. Do I get 365? I got 330. Do I get 365 for this adorable dinner? <laughs> 365. 365 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. 365. 365. Uh, I'm looking for 365. <laughs> I want to make this go fast. I'm going up by one tenth. Yeah. 365. Do I get 400? I've got 365. 400 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. Last chance to bid 400 or more. Who's bidding? Okay, I got 400. Do I get 440? <laughs> Sorry, four, make it 435. Do I get 435 for this is for? Yes, 435. Do I get uh, Do I get 470 for this is for? <laughs> What is he saying? Seventy five. Four? Five. I've got four seventy five. Um do I get five twenty for this adorable? Do I get five twenty for this adorable canoe? <laughs> 520 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. Last chance to bid 520 or more for this is your Last chance to bid 520 or more to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom. Last chance. Going. Going. Gone to 475. Please come down. Pago will arrange it with you. Okay, so then when it's done, I give you the to do. Now, <laughs> what? He gets it after he pays you. <laughs> so now it's time for.